All right. Hello and welcome to the Yet Another Value podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Walker. And with me today, I'm excited to have for the second time, my friend, Jacob Rubin. Jacob is the CIO of Philosophy Capital. Jacob, how's it going? Andrew, uh, thanks for having me back. Yeah, it's going okay. We're trying to make it to the end of the year. We got uh, a certain little Fed announcement today. We've had a fun November. So, you know, we're here. It feels like a, just a race to zero before the end of the year, but uh, I, I hear you. Let me start yeah. this podcast the way I do every podcast. First, a disclaimer to remind everyone that nothing on this podcast is investing advice. We, Jacob and I traffic, especially Jacob, in some quirkier, hairier stocks. So everybody should just particularly remember that advice today, not investing advice. Please go consult a financial advisor and do your own due diligence. Second, a pitch for you, my guest. People can go back and listen to our first episode for our pitch. But, you know, I think the best pitch I can give you currently is our mutual friend, Leo Plum Capital. He's uh, he's going to work for you. And Leo does great due diligence. He's a great guy. And he wouldn't be going to work for you if he, he didn't do all the due diligence on you and thought you were uh, a great person to go work with. So I, I'm really happy for the two of you. Look, a, and big, I think that's a, big, a big thank you to you and the community you're building because um, you put me in touch with Leo. And I think people out there, especially in the investment context, know there are labor issues going on. I think there's a Reddit thread of you know quitting work up to 1.3 million members last I checked and you know so finding someone as of Leo's caliber who fits us perfectly was just such a you know an amazing fortuitous thing and I thank you and and we're really excited we just had Leo out we actually fun anecdote I mean part of our process that we do we we flew him out and and he sat with us for a whole week in the office to just absorb the culture see how we mesh do our strategy uh, and that way he knows really what he's doing with us and we know what we're doing with him. And it's just a perfect match. I mean, Leo's great. And so anyone who followed Plum Capital or his sub stack, um, they, they can see what a good writer he is, a clear thinker he is. And I, I really am excited for what he's going to do to our team. Yeah. And I thought your process when you were recruiting him, as Jacob said, he, he flew him out and they spent a whole week together in the office. I thought that was the coolest recruiting process I've seen. But anyway, we're not here to talk about Leo, even though he's great. We're here to talk about two stocks today. But first, our, the first time we did a podcast was on uh, Eros ESGC. That hasn't worked out spectacularly, to say the least. And I think there were lots of questions of that. I know you wanted to take two minutes to talk about that. And then we can maybe switch over to FTAI and GLNG. Yeah, you set it up perfectly. Um, you know, what we really want to do is focus on FTA and, and Golar, not just to put the past in the past, but because it's fun and it's the point of the podcast and, and the, the job professional investing is to get back on the bike and to keep pedaling and, and to not let it impact your work rate. Um, and so, yeah, I really do want to spend the majority of the time today on those new ideas. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't at least give the, the very brief postmortem um, because I came on a pod pitched this ESGC, and it was a spectacular debacle. Worst investment of my career, worst investment of our fund. Um, for the avoidance of doubt to anybody listening, we lost money on it. We bought high and sold low. Um, and that's what it was. Um, and so if I, if I give you a little more detail uh, to recap for that, what that podcast was all about, it was a, a spectacularly risky binary situation um, where it was an if-then statement. If they get their financials done, if they sort out their current maturities, yep. if they solve the corporate governance problems with India and the US, if they did those things, we thought there was a valuable business. We thought the industry around sort of content production, if you look at what Reese Witherspoon's company did or MGM and Lionsgate, you see all the, everybody wants content factories, um, plenty of logical buyers for that out there. Uh, we thought they would behave like a normal company, do an investor day, communicate, stop being opaque, stop being a black box, and you'd have price discovery. What happened? Nothing of, in, in the if part of that equation happened. We lay out as part of our process a, a roadmap with mile markers that are objective and quantifiable, and it helps us know if we're right or wrong. And if we're right, like take a Will Scott, our biggest position over the years from nine bucks to 40, they do everything they say, every single thing they say. And we, we have predictions and then they, they do it. And we tell our partners, hey, look, that's what we just said in our last letter. We just wrote about it. Oh, we're, we feel so smart. Yay. But importantly, we add, we buy more. Well, the flip side is probably even more important and more true, which is when you don't tick the boxes, I know I'm wrong. I, I got something wrong. It is not doing what I thought. And I need to risk manage, which means more work, re-underwrite, 
And if I don't get comfortable and, and the explanations are not sufficient, eventually you sell and eventually you exit and you have the humility and, the, and you take the embarrassment, you take the pain, but you, you move on. And so that's what happened here. They, they, as March deadline, April deadline, July deadline uh, came and went and they didn't produce any financials, nothing improved. We huddled internally over time. This were long-term oriented, but we have to account for new information. It wasn't tracking. And so eventually we, we took, the, took the L. Um, and what I'll leave you and your listeners with is just a couple of lessons learned. And, and these apply. Um, and you can probably see my selection in FTI and Golar, the fact that I have two names, the margin of safety on these investments. It's all, you can see the learning in real time, okay? A um, couple of lessons learned. The first one is podcast selection. <laughs> This was a mistake that I made above and beyond the mistake of the investment, which is we curate, we create a portfolio of 30 odd longs, 30 odd shorts that are idiosyncratic. They're sized. One of our best risk tools, is, as I'm sure you have too, is, is sizing. So we have a roadmap to know if we're right or wrong. And we can make the ones that are tracking well with bolstered conviction big. The ones that don't track are small or we exit. And the ones that have certain risks like binariness or they're very hairy um, or debt cliffs, they need to be sized appropriately. Um, well, that's, that's a portfolio, but a podcast, like, oh, how many am I going to do? I show up, I pitch one thing and I leave and then it lingers. And what I've learned is it floats in the ether and it gathers comments. And if I ever read it, I'll go, you know, cry myself to sleep. And so you have to find this balance. And the truth is my bias was I find a lot of Iris zone pitches and podcast pitches, super boring. Like let's pick our, the <laughs> right to the heart of the like, podcast. No, no. Okay. Well, so if I took your whole library, there there's some fraction that are really fun to listen to, and some are a little more down the middle. And I just the way I'm wired, I don't really want to listen to the boring ones or the predictable ones or the here's why it's 25% too cheap. I like the fun stuff, the off the run stuff. That's our strategy. That's how I'm wired. And I let that blind me in my selection. And it should be a balance. It should because we don't have a full idiosyncratic portfolio cobbled together. You know, this this should be something with a margin of safety that's a long-term orientation. Like these two today are, are top five positions that we plan to own for a long time. There's nothing in the next couple of months that I envision changing my mind dramatically. Um, always reserve the right, but we have to just see what happens in the world. Uh, it should be a balance. It should be fun and interesting and a little bit different without being completely, you know, binary. You know, look, I think one of the things I've learned from the podcast and from my writings and the blog and stuff is, you know, say there are two companies that are both worth 10, but one of them has $8 in debt and $1, or sorry, $7 in debt and $1 in equity value. So it's worth eight as an enterprise, but if it went to 10, the stock would triple. Whereas another had, it's just worth eight, <laughs> no debt. So if it went to 10, the stock would be up 20%, 25%, whatever people tend to gravitate towards the ones that are much more, oh my God, there's huge upside, huge hair, huge leverage, all this type of stuff. And then when they don't work out because you know they've got $7 debt and $1 equity, people are freaking out, but you know they just kind of pass on the one that, hey, it's worth, it's at eight, it's, I think it's worth 10, there's no debt. I just find like the ones with like really high upside, lots of hair, attract lots of eyeballs and people go crazy on them. And I'm with you, it needs to be like, idiosyncratic position sizing. And I don't know, but right. I've definitely noticed if I say, Hey, something, this thing might have a short squeeze potential. People go like the views on it, double there's huge right. engagement and everything. Right. Anyway, neither here nor there. Anything else on ESGC or do you want to turn to the two stocks we're going to talk about? Well, look, I is for all conspiracy, conspiracy theories or any other, th it's very simple. It was a, a, a bad investment. It didn't track a couple lessons learned corporate governance in foreign jurisdictions is a big deal chalk that up to lesson learned. Yeah. I will take that into account as I assess new new ideas in the future. Uh, I will think a little bit harder about what goes on podcasts to the extent we decide to stay in the public domain. Um, and on we go. And, th and that's the point is like, if you're not wired to take a mistake and move on, like do something else with your passion or your time or your money or your profession in my case. And I think one of my key attributes hopefully is yeah, I'm embarrassed and I feel bad and I lost money personally and the fund did, but we move on and we keep going. And over time, this is not a hundred percent hit rate business where this is like baseball. And what I need to do is have a good batting average. And when they're, when I, when I whiff, I need to find it early and contain the damage. 
which I think we did adequately here. Uh, and when I get it right, put some chips behind it. And that's the job. And so that's just the sort of high level. And now let's talk F type, let's talk Golar, let's get into it because these ideas Perfect. are really fun. And that's, you know, that's behind us now. Perfect. Well, let's start with the one that I think just, uh, they're both very interesting, but I, I've got a history with aerospace and infrastructure. I, I love the, these. So let's start with the one I, a little bit more in my wheelhouse, F tie. And I'll, I'll just turn it over to you. What, Great. what is F tie, Fortress, uh, Fortress, uh, what is it? Aviation and industrial? Is, is that right? I can't remember. A yeah. Aviation infrastructure. But uh, Fort Fortress, it's, it's a very literal ticker Fortress yeah. Transportation and Infrastructure, F T A I. Um, but, why don't we turn it over to you? What are they? Why are you so interested? All that type of stuff. So, um, yeah, and I have kind of a framework. I saw the, the Twitter thread. I saw the questions. They're fair. Nothing new, nothing we haven't thought of or dealt with. Um, and, and I saw, you know, what you said, what your father. So I'd like to hit it all. But I think a framework is sort of, okay, what is it? Then there's a technical. Um, there just is a, a, a catalyst heavy uh, sort of event orientation to this. Um, which is quite interesting because it's three to six months out. It's timely. Then you've got these two business units, um, aviation and infrastructure. So if we sort of tick through and maybe after each section, you know, we can take questions on sort of the sure. technical stuff. Sure. Okay. So what is it? It's, it's FTAI. It's a pass-through LLC corporate structure generating a K-1. It has 99 million shares outstanding, trading at 24 bucks or so, call it 2.3, 2.4 billion equity cap. It has 2.3 billion of uh, corporate debt, 700 million of Jefferson project debt, 294 consolidated basis of, of long range yep. power plant debt, 315 million preferred. And then they just picked up a bunch of engines from Avianca, Colombian airline and, and Alitalia. And there's about 350 of debt funding for that. That's a lot to say 5.9 billion enterprise, tons of debt and a small preferred. And I'm throwing lots of numbers at you. Um, we have a deck that we just figured, uh, I haven't really done this before, but we'll just make it available and you can look at it. So oh, great. I, I'll give so you that I'll link. Put, I'll put the notes, the put link in, in the, the show notes. Yeah, so put in the show it. notes and people can click on it and you can see the numbers I'm laying out. It's all public stuff. And um, I, I've seen an early copy of the deck. It's definitely worth checking out if you're interested. And I, I, you said the disclaimer earlier. Let me just reiterate the disclaimer. If we made mistakes, we did. Um, we're talking our book. We did our best. We can change our minds in the future. All those disclaimers, like this is super honest and down the middle, we're just doing what we do. But I, I do want people to have the perspective of like, do your own work, read the disclaimer on page two. It's like, there's, there's a reason we don't like to share because I don't want to get hung out to dry if I accidentally did something wrong, but we, I did my best. So that's the structure. Um, what, they, what they are, these two segments, we'll get into each segment because it's actually nuanced and a little tricky. So I, I just want to leave it with, that's the capital structure. That's, it's an LLC. And now the, the technical setup, let's just dive right into it. Um, the first part of the technical setup is that this is two different businesses that don't really have any synergies with each other. Yep. Infrastructure and aviation, they certainly don't have any operating. There's no overlap. They don't procure things uh, together and have some you know, scale benefit on the cost side. There's, there's nothing. Um, you might argue that the relationship with Fortress and the ability to raise uh, attractive capital um, is important in both cases, building a giant project that takes five years to build before it turns on or playing offense in, in tough times for airlines and being able to pick off engines at attractive prices and one to raise money in a tough environment. Sure, but they don't be, need to really be together to get the capital market sec, uh, benefits. Um, so they really don't belong to each other. And what we found too is infrastructure investors are niche and specialized. Um, they're used to the cadence of say these long-term projects. They are willing to look from you know conception to some sort of building phase to then you sign up a 15 year offtake agreement with some great counterparty and then you give credit for it incrementally mm -hmm. and then one day it turns on and eventually it produces and once it produces and it's on a 15 20 year deal and you put some 20 times multiple and then the five times you know five percent sort of rate um then it works for infrastructure at brookfields of the world but they don't know or care about aviation and then you got aviation investors and what infrastructure does is not only does it is it a different model it obfuscates the consolidated financials because you take the debt on the chin day one. Your enterprise value reflects the 700 of Jefferson debt in this case, or the yep. you know, of 25 of Rapano or 294 consolidated to, to Longridge. You're taking a billion dollars of debt on the chin 
and they might not have even turned on. I mean, Jefferson did 3 million at EBITDA last quarter. So let's say you annualize to 12 and look at the 700 of debt. And what does that do to your consolidated metrics, both leverage and valuation? It just ruins everything. And so it's noise. And so when you split, you get two pure plays and you can assess the capital structure, the business plans and, and, and the prospects independently. And it plays into different investor bases. So I think, you know, we always talk about these corporate events is, is sometimes you're consolidating everything and then everybody wants to split everything. This is logical. And I really talking to a lot of investors and getting a feel for the lay of the land, I think it makes a ton of sense and they're going to do it. I think that filing, whether it's confidential filing or a public filing, I don't know, but I think it happens this month. They've, it is all public, but like it's happening by year end and sometime in the first quarter, it will be effectuated. This is timely. It's happening. They get it. And we're excited about it. Number two, K1s. I saw your comment where you're like, I'm not sure it's like that good of a thing. I am the exact opposite. I have come to the view that it's very real and it's a big pain in the ass. Jake, can I, can I just jump in here? So K1s, yeah. what he's referring to is right now, FTAI is structured as a, uh, an LP structure, basically. So if L you buy it, it's an LLC yeah. path through entity. So if you buy it, if you go buy stock on the open market, at the end of the year, you will get a K1 which yes. is for many people, it's a disaster because K-1s are complicated. They make, your, yeah. they make your life much more complicated. As part of this split off that they're filing that they should announce officially, they, they've said this publicly, but they should announce officially sometime in December. Hopefully they split off in Q1 of 2022. They will go from a LLC pass-through structure into two different C-Corps, which C -corp. are normal stocks that you don't get a K-1 for. So just to so, make sure everybody knows what we're yeah. talking about. And so there's the pain in the ass thing for like individuals, like you just said, like you don't want to file a K-1 and you can make the decision. Do you want to deal with the K-1? Is it worth it or not? Fine. But there's some bigger ramifications. So, um, and we've done this statistically and we've sort of gone through the, the nuts and bolts of this particular situation. Statistically, we looked at all the alt managers, the Apollos and Carlos of the world that all converted. And they were weighing the tax benefit of their structure with all the benefits of not being a K-1 producing entity. And they all came to the decision to, to convert to C-Corps. And then there's been some energy companies as well, some partnerships, um, notably New Fortress Energy, another Fortress entity, uh, they converted. So we analyzed two things, stock performance relative to the S&P over 12 months. We found an average uh, of 20% uplift outperformance over S&P for the list that we ran. Um, and every single one outperformed the S&P. Now, uh, we didn't do everything. And if you run everything, I'm sure the numbers are different, but our, our set was pretty powerful. Interestingly as well, the liquidity doubled. 107%, I believe is what we, we showed, uh, increase in daily trading volume. And I can say as one investor, we care about trading volume. Speaking to many investors, we all care about trading volume. It's very important. So we get an uplift in performance and liquidity. And if you think about sort of why that makes sense or why that would be, it's a couple of things. One, index, index funds, they don't own K1 producing entities. So they don't have, there's no, there's no, there are no indices in FTI. It's 40% of the market flows. So supply demand, like it's a whole bunch of demand for your stock that doesn't exist right now. So let's get the indices. And believe me, these guys, they're savvy. The, the FTI team, they're all over it. They're going to talk to every relevant index where they could be eligible. Give them the heads up here. It's coming. And I don't know when it happens, but I think, I think they do quarterly rebalance type stuff. So, you know, hopefully some of these index start, start buying at the end of the, I don't know, first quarter, we'll, we'll see. Um, also, let's say you're an institutional investor. I've talked to so many long onlys who the first thing they say is K1, pencils down, can't do oh, it. Yep. Done. Yep. Stop, stop talking. I'm like, I even tried to pitch. I'm like, they're not going to be a K1 in Q, producing entity in Q1. So do the work now, get smart. I think it's smart. Uh, so that when they convert, assuming it doesn't just pop like crazy, and they normally don't pop like that day, it takes time. Oh, uh, I owned KKR when they flipped, and it, it, it took time. And I remember they would always say, oh, our volume's up. And I'd say, yeah, but your stock price isn't up. But it, no, it did exactly. Up. And so I'm yeah. saying, just wait. And then there's going to be a day where T plus one, you can buy it with no K1. And you can just, you'll, you'll have done all the work. So get ready, if that's your orientation. So some guys, no K1. Some other folks... Um, by mandate, can't do K-1s. And then still others, um, they can do it, but they're going to do it on swap, which basically means they'll come up with a unilateral agreement with a prime to have the economic interest in the underlying and the prime deals with everything. Mm -hmm. The problem is what I found specifically on FTI is this swap capacity is very, very tight. It's hard to find. 
you need to go find it with a bank who will take sort of all the logistical side to it. Um, and you need to find a swap line. And I know of an investor who has tens of millions in this stock. I won't name them, but um, they told me a horror story of when they, they wanted to buy it. They tried to get a swap and it was a horrible situation that took a while to resolve and they almost had to walk away. When this is done, that is just ancient history. And so whether it's guys who, who couldn't come in or um, want to be bigger, but they're hamstrung by this swap issue, or it's folks who can't do swap and can't do K-1s. Um, and by the way, uh, Chris, our, our analyst also pointed out, um, it's not even eligible for Robinhood. Like Robinhood doesn't do these. It's not Robinhood even on there. Robinhood won't let you buy, uh, oh, so I, 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 I Don't, if, if we're wrong, blame Chris, because he told me, <laughs> uh, but what I'm hearing is it's not even on there. So well, point is, I, I don't want to spend all day on the technical. K-1 goes away, we split into two pure plays, and I think this is all very helpful. So, so that's, I mean, that's just like classic right up the middle of a Ben investing, right? You've got a company, it's going to go through a split, it, and then you get it, the cherry on top, it goes from LLC K-1 to two separate C-Corps, so it really opens it up, self up to Lots of incremental buyers, lots of people who might want to play. Hey, I want to play in aviation recovery. Hey, I only want these infrastructure assets. So that's perfect. That's right. But let, let's dive into the business. You know, yes. what are the infrastructure assets they own? What are the aviation assets they own? So we break down this thing and ultimately we get to a, and this is not now or necessarily next year. It could be a few years down the line. So I'm not just pie and sky lunatic, but we, we see that this could be $80 of value. And just the rough split, we have something like 65 going to aviation. So it's not that infrastructure is not valuable and it actually could be much more, but with our conservative assumptions, we see the, the picture on aviation a little more clearly. So I'll start there. Um, and there, there are some catalysts to, to each business that we, we haven't touched on that are almost sort of belong in the technical section, but um, they're more business specific. So if we dive into aviation first, because it's the, the bulk of the pie, um, what, is, what is it? Uh, 439 odd engines that they own and lease. Some of these are stapled to aircraft and some just are freestanding. Um, and so this started as this asset leasing business, different than just straight air leasing, which was aircraft and oftentimes brand new. These are used and engines. So there's two sources of arbitrage, which has led to a better margin over time because it's there's more inefficiency in going used and in going just engines. But um, that's what it was. The critical point around aviation is that this is an evolution from some kind of leasing business yep. to something totally different that is just apples and oranges. And if you're trying to do some air leasing framework with book values or whatever, it's wrong. It's not what this business is go forward. And that's sort of my job or the opportunity here is to explain it. And hopefully if it's compelling, great. Um, because what they've done is around these aircraft, but predominantly engines, they have done a few major strategic moves. And this is like playing in the long game, talk about playing chess. So one thing they've done is vertically integrate into the hot section of their engine. So, so to give one more bit of color, the predominant engine in the fleet is a CFM 56. This is a joint venture between Safran and GE Aviation. And that's interesting when I get to modularization, because as a result of being this, this combined entity, they have these three modules and a lot of say Rolls-Royce engines are not modularized, but these are. They are also the most prolific engine in the world, 22,000. They power 737s, A320s. They're all over the place, predominantly narrow body and cargo. And if you're thinking aviation, narrow body means a little bit more you know, domestic. It should snap back and be more resilient. And cargo has just been a powerhouse through the whole thing, right? Yep. If you're talking COVID, cargo is awesome. So it's a, it's a very prolific engine. We're talking 449 out of you know, 22,000. So 2,200 would be 10%, you know, 220 is one. So they're like 2% penetration. Um, I don't think they're going to get the OEM's attention. And this is more relevant to the aftermarket until they're eight to 10%. So uh, market share. So this thing can grow the fleet many times over before being, you know, an annoyance to the, to the big guys out there. So if you're wondering sort of the TAM or the opportunity, it's underpenetrated large TAM. So that's part of it. So staple to this fleet and this backdrop is, the vertical integration. They have a joint venture with a privately owned aerospace company. Um, and this company uh, with FTAI is, is producing five parts that go in the hot section of this engine. And they got the first one FAA approved this year. 
The second approval is probably, I don't know, Q1 event. I think they're getting it submitted right now. And once they get two approved, these are 60% of the value. And then the other three will take another year. But when they get two approved, if you're a customer, you don't really want to drop an engine and do a bunch of work and put in one part if the second is coming and is also a big cost component. So we believe customers are sort of waiting. You get two approved. It's the majority of the value. And, and now it's going to be a while for the other three. Now it's sort of enough to say, all right, let's do it. So that is on the come. It's not producing anything for them yet, but this is a PMA, FA, you know, certified aftermarket parts where the only other pr production option, the only other way to get these parts is OEM and they price in the stratosphere. And so if you look at Heiko, I was about to say, this is reminiscent of what Heiko does, right? And they've mentioned exactly. this. Exactly. This yeah. is very high quality. And if you think about why, the ROIC is tremendous. The depth and width of the, the, the moat is huge. And once they go in, almost like an authorized generic, once they go in with this aftermarket part and they figure out casting and coding and the manufacturing process, and they go through FAA certification, once they've done all that, who, who's going to want to invest the capital and the machinery and the know-how to follow them into this niche little part? No, the answer is nobody. I mean, in my opinion, well, I'll be very surprised if we start seeing that there's some other entity that's going to follow them in. Again, it's reminiscent of Heiko, right? Everybody used to say, well, this oh, is well, why Heiko trades like 25 times yeah. or whatever. People you say, oh, the, the OEMs are going to shut them down or this. Well, that didn't happen. And then people no. would say, well, if they can do it, uh, you know, other people are going to come do it. And no, no, nobody could come. There, there are hundreds of parts or thousands of parts and plenty of engines and other aircraft over time where aftermarket comes in. And if you take a small amount of market share, it is best for everybody to just leave well enough alone. And so that's the idea here is you could actually go up to 5% of this market and the JV at that rate would be at full scale, 5% market share would make something like 200 million EBITDA. We mm -hmm. have 25, we get 25% of it. So right off the bat, we get 50 million of EBITDA at scale at 5% market penetration. And what's that worth? That is pure play aftermarket parts. And we have comps and that's very valuable. And oh, by the way, has nothing to do with leasing. But interestingly, it's super synergistic when you have a whole fleet of used engines that require that part when you do overhauls. Yep. So what it actually does is it fuses with this business and helps it evolve such that you will become the low cost provider of a product and service globally that nobody matches. And to give one bit of context, to overhaul this engine right now is like 6 million bucks. By the time all these parts are done, and it will take time, combined with the other efforts I'll talk about in a second, they'll, they'll be able to overhaul these things for two and a half or $3 million. Yep. So if you were, by the way, thinking about book value, okay, how much does it cost to buy that engine? Well, you'll pay the market rate, which is going to be based inextricably on what it costs to refurb these things. But now you can refurb at half the cost. So your book value, you know, what you paid, what, what it went on your books for is dramatically understated uh, because you're going to be, it's going to be twice as valuable to you as anyone else. And oh, by the way, you might be able to tear it down more than once. And I haven't even gotten to the AAR and Lockheed and now I'll do that. So they've built this platform. One of these, you know, three amigos or three legs on the stool is the parts, the vertical integration. But then they have an MRO capability, maintenance and repair where it's a long story, but they were opportunistic in the middle of COVID. Uh, Lockheed does business with Canada, wants to do business with Canada. They have a facility in Montreal, 300,000 plus square feet, a couple hundred people work there. And those jobs could be in jeopardy because no one's doing shop visits. They're cannibalizing their fleets. They're not spending capital on their equipment because it's been a really tough go through COVID. So to sort of save the jobs and keep the facility, um, FTI started talking to them. They've wanted to do an MRO angle for years and here, boom, perfect fit. So now they have this thing where if they break down engines into modular components and let's say one or two uh, require some work, but one is pristine, they can drop it and send it to Montreal and put it on a shelf and over time create a store and they can offer it to airline. This is something airlines do internally. Yep. But for the broader world, for smaller fleets, has not been done before. It's novel. This is new stuff. It's a product and service that's tremendously valuable and hasn't been done. So they're going to have modules, these three primary modules on the shelf up in Montreal with a bunch of technicians ready to you know, do all the work around it. Then the third thing that they've built is this AAR partnership. So that's a 
AIR ticker, public company. Um, and what we can do here is as parts, when you scope an engine and you say, ah, this one is not usable, let's say, or, or maybe these modules are, but this other part of the engine's not, you scrap it. They are going to send it now to their partner, AAR, that will take it on consignment, refurbish it, work it, work on it, and then sell it out into their network, which is what their business is, uh, take a commission. And this is accretive to all parties, but this is great for, for FTAI because essentially when you do the unit economic you know, analysis, which we've done, and you buy an engine and you, you put it to work, you rebuild it, you put it to work again. And, and so capital goes out for the rebuild, you put it to work again. And then eventually some or all of it gets salvaged. This boosts that salvage value. And so better salvage value, the ability to modularize, which, which will be even better economics and salvaging, um, and then vertically integrating so you can rebuild parts at cost instead of OEM. And the difference between OEM and cost is huge. But, we're talking way more than 50% savings. Yep. Um, big. Um, so they've built this thing. So if you want to use a hodgepodge of terminology, is it, it's a platform because it's all these things working together to be an aftermarket product and service company because it's really focused on this engine that these are used engines um, being built and rebuilt and, and leased out. Um, it just still does leasing but it's also vertically integrated into the parts. So it's sort of this aftermarket aviation platform business that hasn't been done. There's no pure comp. And for hopefully some of the reasons cited, like these old you know, um, constructs that you do use for air cap or air lease, they just don't apply. So let, let me back up for a second and just, I just wanna summarize what you're saying. So they've got a very attractive call option, growth opportunity, whatever you, you wanna describe it as where they're going to do with engines, kind of what Heiko does, right? They're going to start, uh, there's a bunch of different angles as you just went through, but the, the main one is they're going to start making their own parts internally for these engines. They can undercut the OEM, sell them. It's going to fuse really synergistically with their current business. But I think the, the critical thing here, because when I was looking up, you can look at my notes. I was just looking at, <laughs> oh, they own engines. How do you value engine? You know, comping its air cap. This business right now, currently produces nothing. It's not really on their books for anything. This is a growth call option that you're describing. Well, here. yeah. And so here, here's a way to do some numbers. And we, we put it out there. Pre-COVID and pre any of this stuff, I think they were doing 1.37 million of EBITDA per engine. They've grown the fleet from a couple hundred to 440. This um, is from leasing. This is from leasing. Yeah. Just talking about yeah, the yeah. engines, the old school, just how many engines and they lease it and they have better margin than the peers, but whatever. 440, there's a utilization factor. The aircraft are like 90% plus, the engines are lower, sort of 50s and 60s. Um, it's low now because of COVID. So there is a reopening angle here. And that is a risk, by the way. If Omicron goes nuts, as it certainly looks like it's going nuts, this might not, this might get delayed by a quarter or two. Um, but we think it's a when, not if, and we're willing to ride it out that the pills and boosters and the fact that it's narrow body and cargo, we think eventually we're going to be okay. But um, if you take utilization at normal rates on a blended aircraft engine basis around sort of low 80s on 440, you could call it 375 utilized assets at 1.37 million per asset. And, you know, you can come up with 500 million bucks at EBITDA. And that's basically taking pre-COVID normal level multiplied by the new fleet size. That's nothing for all that cool stuff I just talked about. The reason mm -hmm. I'm here, the reason there's a big target is all the new stuff. So the new stuff they have quantified at scale could be, you know, 200 or 220 million of incremental. And that would be basically like that rebuild at six, so that's now two and a half or three. They'll share some of the economics with customers. It's, it's going to be a business decision. And then some of it they'll keep for themselves. And that's incremental. So you take the number of shop visits per year times the savings. Boom. Great. Um, so we, we can get over time towards 700 at EBITDA. And I don't think it's crazy. I don't think it's next year. So that is not what I'm saying. I'm not doing a 2022 estimate, but I'm saying we build towards 700 from something like 500. Um, frankly, I'm not totally sure what they'll do next year because it depends probably in part on how this Omicron stuff goes. And I don't care that much is the bottom line. And so then, then the next question is, all right, what's the right multiple? And I've talked about Heiko and Transdime, and God, I would love to just be their multiple, but it's only a part of the story. It's a small part of the story. So I'm going to be fair. I, we just blend it. It's a small part of our sort of blended multiple. You look at MROs, 
it's a little tricky on lease on the, le the leasing companies because they're so different and people really do it on not EBITDA. You know, it's, DNA is real um, for leasing businesses. So it's not, it should be more on EBIT. But we think it's going to a more asset light service oriented model. So we think EBITDA or free cash flow eventually will be relevant here. So we don't really have that much of a problem looking forward. And so simple math, we can get to something like an 11 times multiple. I mean, again, it's like 20 plus times for Heiko, mid teens for Transdime. So you blend a little bit of that in the MROs trade sort of low double digits. And then, you know, and then you, you figure out what you want to do with the leasing comp. So we, we shake out at 11. So you can get on 700, whatever, 8 billion. And then I didn't even talk about that. The JV, that, that what I said was 25% of 200 at 5% market penetration, pure play aftermarket parts business. We think super valuable. You slap like a 15 times on 50, another 750. So big picture, you can get to like 8750, strip out some debt divide by the share count. And that's how we get to our big number. And you can quibble on the multiples, fine, whatever. You can say they've been missing. And I'd say, yeah, it's freaking COVID, fine. Like, yes. And if you think COVID lasts forever, then you probably don't want to go in aviation, okay. Um, but big picture, we just think they're building something really innovative in an in, in, in industrial, you know, sleepy value name. So it's kind of cool. So let me ask some questions. I think the first question that jumps out on the aviation side would be, all right, they're doing this. It seems really interesting. Why has no one else done this before, right? And, and, and that will jive into the second question. So, so I'll just ask it now. The second question would be, you know, they've got quotes about how attractive leasing engines is versus leasing aircraft. And, you know, I know the guys from Aircap, uh, they're, they're extremely smart. And Aircap has had engine leasing before. For those who don't know, Aircap is the largest aircraft lessor. And Aircap, every time they get involved in the engine leasing business from an acquisition or something, they basically run it off. They want nothing to do with it, engine leasing. So my two questions to you would be, one, why hasn't anyone do done it? And two, why hasn't anyone done the aftermarkets part side that they're trying to do? And then number two, is the engine leasing business as good as you're saying if the largest aircraft lesser in the world, every time they touch it, tries to run it off? And, you know, there's some stocks in the stock, there's some smaller engine lessers I'm familiar with that maybe haven't performed that, that well. So those would be my two questions. So the, the best answers I have, and these are educated based on what management says and what makes sense to me and what I see out there is some of those air leasing businesses are, are quite large. And they do big, shiny deals on the newest and greatest models, and they order billions worth. Yep. Um, and so working on used engines that are like three million, two million a pop to buy, where you're nickel and diming, where at times you're not buying much, and then you're trying to buy and play offense when the market's in turmoil. That's what these guys do. And you're, you're thinking more like a distress type fund. Um, it's not that sexy. It's not a needle mover if you get too big. Um, it's a niche thing. And it's something where you either should be all in like f -tie and became, become the world dominant player at this niche, or you shouldn't do it. And you stick yep. to the bread and butter. And if you're an employee at one of the big guys, like, do you want to go work on two or $3 million used engines? Or do you want to go work on billion dollar giant, you know, sexy dreamliners or whatever? Like, that's my, my first answer. Um, I think one of your tweets quoted that part of, of Joe's response, the CEO chairman here. And I, I think, I think that holds some water. Uh, maybe it's a line, but it, it makes sense to me. Um, I think, I think also, if you just think about air leasing and why it's so different, like I'm trying to contrast what we're doing here to air leasing, air leasing. If you go back to like, um, ILFC back in, you know, when it, spun out of AIG. I mean, the, the, the birth of this industry for air leasing, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe they staple themselves, in that case, AIG to a AAA rated credit. They have a better through the cycle cost of capital than airlines. So they, they optimize this, this ARB spread by having a cap, capital, you know, cost of capital um, advantage, and then they negotiate scale-based OEM discounts. And th that's sort of the value they bring to the market. They can take a 10, 11, 12% ROE, then they lever the hell out of it. And they're this middleman. And maybe they have some value add beyond that. It's tenuous. They, they get the OEM discounts, they have lower cost of capital, and then they offer a leasing product. It's, so that is something you know where I do think book value is relevant. Um, it's just, it's a different model. Those guys need to be focused on capital markets, their cost of capital, their OEM relationships, and big deals that move the needle. I just, it's just different. So 
I, I, I don't think their lack of involvement here is some negative signal. Okay, that makes sense. And then, uh, you know, I, I don't think we fully addressed it in the question. Why has no one else tried the aftermarket's part side? Um, I don't think it's easy to do. I think, yeah. I think getting these designs right and building them to spec, this is a highly regulated industry where one crash is devastating. And so you've got this regulatory body that, that oversees everything. So to have the, the engineering know-how, to commit the capital and the resources to a project to recreate these parts, and then to, to have the confidence that you have a market to sell it into and to have those relationships, it's just a rare combination of know-how, capital, relationships that just doesn't exist broadly. And if you want to go you know, create the Andrew Walker aftermarket's parts business, like good luck. I guess not easy. Uh, so- I do like, I think they've got an advantage doing it here because they have the, the engine leasing side of the business. So they have almost a built-in customer to kind of like internally spin this up, right? Very similar to how Amazon had the retail side to internally spin up Amazon web service, right? They had the demand. So am I thinking about that correctly where that might be what gives them the edge to do this where other players probably couldn't get in here? Yeah, and and I, I got to make one more big picture point if you're thinking about this. So we, we, we alluded to COVID and sort of the, near-term headwinds but and, and relatively recent you know past headwinds but hopefully in the future um we come back there's some some other wrinkles here that could be bullish um number one shop visits are way down we've plotted it out people are cannibalizing fleet as i mentioned um instead of doing capital intensive overhauls of engines yep. you know so you can't do that forever eventually the, all, you drop engines, you take your grounded fleet and put the engines on, on flying planes or you swap planes or whatever you do. And eventually you run out of what they call green hours. And now you got to fix your engines, um, which is cheaper than buying new ones. So you're going to fix your engines eventually. Um, that is kind of like spring-loaded demand. I mean, eventually they're going to owe, the, the bill's going to come due. Second of all, airlines are struggling. Um, you know, the stocks hold up because everyone's trying to play the reopening trade. But I mean, how many more interested legroom can they can they weasel out? You know, I mean, these guys have these unionized workforce. They're cap the tough business, uh, very competitive. It's famously a tough business to run an airline. They need to save cash, however they can, and they yep. have, many of these major airlines have not done major engine leasing programs before. We think it has never made more sense for them to consider it now. And we're not alone in that. The FTI sees it. And you can rest assured they're trying to pitch all these guys. So we certainly hope to see some deals with big fleets. Um, and we think that's out there, you know. And just going back to the, the part side of the business, you know, so when you were talking about, you said, I, I think the company can do $700 million in EBITDA, slap an 11 times multiple once we blended on it. Like what happens if you are wrong. They've got approval for one part. They're hopefully getting approval for the second part, which you think is the catalyst to get that business kind of spun up. But what if you're wrong and nobody comes to this or they don't get approval for the next legs apart? Like what would the EBITDA drop down to and what would your valuation look like then? So let's look at, I guess, the pro forma aviation business. It'll be, there's the two, three, a corporate debt stays here. Yep. But then they're going to get an intercompany from infrastructure to 800. So you're going to knock that to one five and there's a 300 million preferred. So you got one eight of liabilities. And if we use the 99 million share count um, and we're just valuing this thing um, at, I don't know, just pick a number. Um, every 10 bucks is roughly a billion of equity, right? So, so um, if you just use $20 for aviation, then you're 2 billion there and you got the one ADA liabilities if you're creating a 3.8 enterprise. And what do you get for it? Well, uh, I told you that at a utilization normalized and at pre-COVID levels, you could spit out at this fleet 500 EBITDA. Um, and you can quibble on the EBITDA stuff. I've laid out why I, I think you could stick to it. You could strip, strip it down to EBIT and put maybe a slightly higher multiple, but I think you're going to come out with pretty good coverage, even at 20 bucks, just for aviation alone. And by the way, the whole stock, including infrastructure is 24 today. So, and I haven't even counted all the new stuff. And the new stuff is 200 odd of EBITDA at a much higher multiple. So God, sky falling and none of the new stuff produces anything. I still think we have a margin of safety. I still think we're okay. There's a real business with a real fleet that's contracting out, that has a utilization that can make money if they start. Now, people point at the cash flow, right? And you say, oh, it's no, CFI. That was going to be the next question. It's so, perpetually uh, negative. Well, guess what? 200 engines went to 450. Was that smart or are they just lighting you know, money on fire? It was smart. And here's why. 
when should they buy used aircraft? When groups like Alitalia or Avianca are in restructuring processes. That's when they're on the back foot. That's, you know, that's when you buy the asset. And that's what th these guys are sharks. They know what they're doing. They're smart. And, and, and it brings up another point, <coughs> which is the management setup with Fortress, what, the incentives. So basically, many of the central overhead, overhead the, the, the executives, their salaries are actually paid by Fortress. But then there's the sort of in exchange, uh, FTI pays Fortress uh, a management fee. Can I just jump in? So sure. what Jake is referring to, and Jacob's actually front running me, that was going to be one of my next questions that in cash flow. For FTAI is externally managed, right? So as you're saying, Fortress is the external manager. Fortress pays it all the guys who actually work at FTAI themselves, but Fortress gets a management fee and an incentive fee. And historically, externally managed companies, people don't like this because it creates a disincentive. It, it, right. it creates it, a mismatch it, 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 of it's the perception. I think yeah. the incentives are fine. And here's why. There's this incentive, there's this uh, management fee that goes to them based on net equity uh, that sort of covers some of the overhead. Eh, you know, it, I don't know that it ties up perfectly. We have a chart and it doesn't tie up perfectly, but it, it covers overhead because Fortress pays some stuff and then they have this management fee. Frankly, no one's getting rich on that fee. Okay, so it's just not that big a deal. The big deal is the incentive fee. And here's how it works. There's an 8% hurdle. This is calculated quarterly. So it's right there in the proxy, a 2% in the quarter, return on net equity. Growing just some empire in and of itself is not growing equity um, because to grow equity, you know, you have the asset value and you have you, how you pay for it and equity uh, and, and your cash and, and debt. Um, you're not just creating equity out of nothing. You, you have to generate value to have equity growth. And it's the net equity change where the incentive fee is, is, is um, that's where it's based. And it's an 8% hurdle. They have a little bit of a catch up between eight and 8.9% in the quarter. It's like between two and 2.2222, whatever uh, is, is where they get 100% um, payout on that little portion. So it's sort of, sort of a catch up on the first eight. And then after 8.9%, it's a 10% incentive fee on creation of net equity. So, okay. Is that fair? Is that good? Is that bad? All I know is go look at like our, our buddy, Mike at non-gap or formerly known as non-gap. Now he's going on to bigger and better, but you can look at these comp plans. You know, you, you go look in some other industry like Dropbox and the founder has PRSUs from 30 to 90 bucks and he gets filthy rich or look at Elon Musk making billions and billions if the stock works. And so we don't really have a problem with RSU payouts and strike prices way up high because we know in the world where they get paid, the stock's up. So the world in which these guys are clipping 10% is a world in which they're creating net equity value north of 9%. And whether you want to give these guys huge grants of RSUs struck at $40 stock or do it this way, I honestly, I don't think the incentive is all that different. But let, let me just push back on one point because they did a deal on the infrastructure side that I think was very, I, I think it was a good deal, right? They acquired US Steel's railroad operations and it's, and the scheme of all the aviation stuff you're laying out is <laughs> not huge, but I think that was a very good deal. It was good, a good buy by them. But at the same time, they did a pretty nice size equity offering to fund that deal. And, you know, historically, this is not a company, it, I'll just, you said that you think aviation is worth $60 per share and they just funded a, a, an accretive infrastructure deal, but they funded it with equity that they issued at like $25 per share, right? And I don't think the management team here would really disagree with a lot of the math you just laid out. So I do look at a company and say, okay, they're doing good deals, but they're willing to fund them with equity offerings at prices that you know seem pretty attractive as a buyer and they're probably not gonna be a share buyback. Well, so how, how do you look at that? So let's be honest. Uh, and I know this from raising a fund. A, a, an incentive fee based on net equity dollars created, they can make more dollars, especially if they keep their headcount flat, they can all get a lot richer if they build a much bigger mousetrap and then create value on the bigger mousetrap. It's like a fund can make a lot more money for its principles if it's bigger than if it's running 10 million bucks. That's true. And uh, they can't deny that. But it's a balancing act because if they grow for growth's sake, it might be harder to create value. They might make mistakes. And so they need to think about creating equity value and being bigger and having sort of equity times incentive fee equal a bigger pile for themselves. Um, so you then judge the deals. Was the re rail deal a good deal? 
Yes, it was. And I think the calculus was not only that they bought 80 million at eight times, and um, that's a fair multiple rails trade between 13 and 17 times out in the broader market. So if they can get away from just US steel, now it's like a 10 or 15 year contract with them, which is good. But if they can diversify the, the customer base and trade anything like rails, and this was a, a home run deal, and they can grow 80 to 100 with some actions they're taking. So holding the multiple, multiple steady, they pay 640, eight times 80, and then eight times 100 could be 800. They create 160 million of value. I mean, there's that. Um, and if they diversify and it re-rates, God bless. But it's also, it gives more heft to infrastructure because they wanted to spin it. It, it was an important part of the, of the spin, right? They needed that yeah, deal well, to get infrastructure. And we we're gonna, I want to spend time yeah. on infrastructure, but infrastructure still I don't has, know if we're going to have enough. <laughs> well, well, infrastructure has Rapano that doesn't produce anything. Jefferson, that's just at an inflection point. It does have half of a power plant producing very steady long-term um, EBITDA, it needed a little more economic heft to it. It did. And so they had different options, sell all those assets one by one yep. or give it a little more heft so it could stand on its own. And that's the option. That's the route they went. And I think it's fine because they did it in a pretty, they know rails. Joe used to run a rail company. I mean, and rails go into their ports. Like they deal with rail. They have run rail. In fact, that's why US Steel allowed them to, to buy it. Uh, l let me just turn yeah. to my last question because we're actually running pretty long and I think we want to talk GLNG as I well. I want to do GLNG, yeah. so we got to do two parts. Just, just last question here would be, you know, I think a, a lot of the commentary, and this relates to the incentive issues we've talked about and everything, but a lot of the commentary here was, hey, this is a really promotional management team. And we'll probably talk about that with GLNG as well. But, you know, somebody pointed out, oh, I think I, I was pretty attracted to Jefferson when I was reading the 10K and reading how they described yes. it. And somebody pointed out, hey, look at what they were saying in 2019 about Jefferson. Like they, they said, this is a dog. They were saying Jefferson was going to do 100 million in EBITDA this year. In, in 2019, they said Jefferson does 100 million instead of 21. They, it's generating basically nothing, right? And they were right. saying, look across the portfolio. This management team has a history over promise, under deliver. And, and that probably relates to the incentive issues we talked about. So I just want to let you address that. <laughs> So I would, first of all, I saw that comment and I, I sort of thought, well, something, something happened in 2020 and, and that something impacted energy markets. Yep. Um, and so, and the movement of, of, of product down from Canada went to zero and uh, movement of all sorts of other commodities ground to a halt and um, EMP crews uh, pulled rigs, pulled man camps, pulled people. I mean, this was a shock to the system. It was a, it was a pandemic. Yep. So um, yes, 2019 pre-COVID targets were missed. I think we understand why. Um, similarly, on a quarterly basis, like we thought they'd do better on Jefferson and Q3 than they did. People are concerned about it. They'll probably not quite hit it. If I had to guess in Q4, it's just not linear. And we're in a world with a pandemic. But look at what they've built. Go through the economics. So he, maybe we'll talk brief. I'll try and hit infrastructure because I've gone on for a long time quickly. Infrastructure has four things. You talked about rail. It's, we, we covered some numbers there. And, and I think we can get to a billion dollars of value there without really stretching the imagination. That would be 10 times 100. Um, you know, they've got some blocking and tackling. I think they'll get there. Long Ridge is a power plant that they built. They sold half of it, but they retain half the economic interest. It's 100 20 going to 130 of EBITDA, they get half, so call it 65. It's super steady, Eddie, long-term contracted power. I think that's a decent multiple. So I think um, there's 300 of debt that belongs to them. And then, you know, above and beyond that, I would give another uh, 450 of equity value or something like that. So you could call it 750, which is a low double digit, you know, 11, 12 times type multiple. So you've got uh, enterprise value basis, um, you know, maybe a billion at rail, which is unlevered at the moment. You've got the 750 of call it long ridge value. Um, Rapano, they've put 325 million in, 25 debt, 300 equity. And I think it's a tremendous facility. We spoke to the guy who runs it. It's an amazing asset on the Delaware River in New Jersey. It's got all sorts of features. Hasn't really turned on yet. So it's not producing anything. Everybody ignores it. We think it's a really unique asset. The guy who, who runs it spent 26 or 27 years at ET. And yep. he used to see it across the river. And he gave us this great anecdote of how he dreamed of one day running that asset. Now he is. So it's a real thing. Um, we just market at book because you know, we don't need, need it for upside, but there is upside, but it doesn't produce anything. That leaves us with Jefferson. Okay. They put 700 million 
into this project for sort of phase one and it's not producing. And so you say, God, is it worth anything? Well, here's what it is. Multimodal terminal with a port for Seaborn with rail, with truck, and it's built pipes into the two largest refineries in North America, Motiva, which is Saudi Aramco and Exxon. And they announced a 10 year deal with Exxon, which by the way, like that's not easy to go, like try and go get an Exxon deal for 10 years. It's not easy. So you got pipes into the two biggest refineries and rail and truck and, and, and by sea. It's super strategic um, and it hasn't ramped yet because COVID has Im, you know, impacted timing, but it's going up. There was a, a Port of Houston terminal that, that traded hands. I think there was another one. God, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna get the name wrong, but there was another one. They were both sort of low double digit multiples. We think, we think they're gonna do it. And I've told management, I'm like, it's time to execute. So whatever you gotta do, like it's time to turn this thing on. They have certain promises. We think over time. So what we did is a unit economic basis. How do they make money? Uh, docking fee, product over, over the port, over the dock into the facility, storage, piping in and out, uh, rail in and out, trucking in and out. It's, they're, they're toll takers. And so we went through sort of on a capacity basis. What could this thing do if it gets utilized? And we think at at a, a reasonable utilization, eventually could do 140. Right now it's doing barely anything. So there's a cadence to it. Maybe it's 50, 60, 70 next year. I don't know, maybe better. Maybe maybe it can go up toward 100. But with Omicron, I, I'm not going to be too aggressive on the timing, but it's going to make its way to 100 plus of EBITDA. And you know, to skeptics, you know, the, the best thing about being skeptical on that is that the numbers will just prove, prove the point. Perfect. Well, hey, Jacob, I think we need to call it here because this is the issue. This is why I only want to do one stop on every podcast. We, we've got to switch over to the GLNG podcast. So uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop the recording here. We'll record GLNG separately so that we can have two separate things. But anyone who's listening, this is part one. We'll be right back with part two. Thanks.